Willard Van Orman Quine's Two Dogmas of Empiricism, originally from 1951, a revised edition from 1961. This is an extremely influential article in contemporary philosophy. It is also a very challenging one. Let's first make sure we know what empiricism is. Empiricism, in the sense in which Quine is using the term, is the tradition in modern philosophy that thinks we get knowledge from sensory experience. Quine begins by saying that modern empiricism operates by two fundamental principles which are not very well justified. These are dogmas for empiricism. There is no good reason to believe them, and we should just get rid of these ideas. The first dogma is the analytic-synthetic distinction, or analicity. This is the idea that some sentences, the synthetic ones, are true contingently, depending on whether they measure up to the facts, and that other sentences, the analytic ones, are true no matter what, true independently of fact. The second dogma we could call logical or conceptual reductionism. This is not a reduction theory in metaphysics, such as the theory that the mind reduces to the brain or something like that. This is a reductionism in philosophy of language. It's the theory that all our ideas reduce to small individual units of sensory experience, such as the sensation of seeing red. So logical or conceptual reductionism is the theory that there are these smallest units of thought. Now, Quine is going to object to these dogmas of empiricism, analicity, and this particular reductionism in philosophy of language. And he's going to give us some advice on how empiricism works without those dogmas. Now, here in this outline, you can see the logical structure of the article. This outline also shows you where the six sections of Quine's article fit into that logical structure. In section one, Quine explains the idea of the dogma of analyticity, and he introduces some of the difficulties involved in explaining it. In sections two through four, Quine will argue that some of the major attempts to explain analyticity actually tend to presuppose analyticity, and so they don't succeed in explaining it, and analyticity is thus unexplained, and it is very likely inexplicable, and we should just get rid of the idea. In section 5, Quine explains why the death of analicity also kills off reductionism. There is a theory, a theory in philosophy of language, that the truth of a statement has two components, one linguistic and one factual. Quine explains that this theory and the dogma of analicity and the dogma of reductionism are all fundamentally the same. For example, if this theory is true, then so is analicity, because in a few special instances, the linguistic component, all by itself, with no relevant factual con content, could be necessarily true. That would be an analytic statement. And if this theory is true, so is reductionism, because the factual component of a sentence would ultimately be about some small number of these smallest units of thought. And if reductionism is true, so is that theory. If there are these smallest units of thought, and if we can make statements about them, which can be verified in experience, then those statements must have factual content as well as a structure, a way of saying something about those facts. And that structure, or that way of saying something, is the linguistic component of the sentence. So reductionism and analicity and this particular theory and philosophy of language all stand or fall together. And since Quine has just shown that analicity is not true, it follows that this theory is not true and reductionism is not true. And so the two dogmas of empiricism have been defeated. In section 6, Quine gives us a look at what empiricism looks like without the dogmas. He says it is more pragmatic and more holistic, and he says there's going to be less of a dichotomy between science and metaphysics. He sums up a lot of this in the last sentence of section 5, where he says, the unit of empirical significance is the whole of science. In other words, our statements about reality are not tested against experience on an individual basis. The whole system of science is tested against experience as a unit. When experience requires a correction in the system, it can be made anywhere in the system where we need it to be made. It doesn't have to be made for any particular point of scientific theory, because there are no particular points of scientific theory which can be tested on an individual basis. Now, one reason this essay of Quine is so important was the negative effects on logical positivism. Logical positivism was a tradition in 1900s philosophy, and it was committed to the theory that all meaningful statements can be tested in sensory experience. And that 
theory, uh, that criterion, was meant to apply to individual statements. And so if Quine is right that this conceptual reductionism is a myth, and that individual statements as such cannot be tested in experience, logical positivism is wrong. And this is how Quine helped to kill logical positivism.